Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you around the world. And welcome to our digital forum, Food Without Farmers. Uh, my name is Conrad Hartfleisch, and I will be the host for the next few hours. And we will be talking about organic agriculture. We'll also be looking at how we envision the future of food and the role that farmers will play in it. And throughout the event, we'll be using a number of interactive tools, and uh, this is how you can also participate. We want you to be part of this process. We're sitting um, thousands of kilometers apart around the globe, but we are still connected. So if you are tweeting, please use hashtag EatHonest or and hashtag ThinkLandscapes. And then we also have Slido, hashtag GLF-IFARM. And here we'll ask questions. We will be able to view your questions and we will use a number of tools to keep sharing thoughts and also getting your ideas. And our first two activities are, once you are in Slido, you will see that there are different rooms. And in room one, we have, what is organic agriculture? And we will have two questions there at the moment, trying to build a word cloud. What are you in mind when you think about organic agriculture? Post it and help us build an idea of what you're thinking about organic agriculture. And then we will also do a little poll, uh, checking on a scale from one to 10, how often you buy organic produce, one being never, 10 being always, and comment why or why you don't. So as we go through the program, we'll come back to Slido from time to time and, uh, and check in with you. But now, without any further ado, I would like to kick off the day by handing over to Louise Luticolt, the Executive Director of IFOM Organics International, and she will be giving us a short introduction to our organization, what we do, why we do it, and why we are collaborating with GLF on this event. Um, so over to you, Louise. Thank you, Conrad, and thank you for the introduction. So um, IFOM Organics International is the global organic agent of change for true sustainability in agriculture, value chains and consumption in line with the principles of organic agriculture and so we are an association and we work with and also on behalf of our 800 affiliates in about 120 countries worldwide so all these organizations have in common that they fully subscribe to the principles of organic agriculture the principles of health ecology fairness and care and we want that more farmers practice organic agriculture or similar approaches like agroecology and that more consumers have the opportunity to eat nutritious, healthy, organic food. And we also want that organic agriculture even gets better and so can contribute to the sustainable development goals and to our common goods. And we doing so, we want to inspire those farmers that are not, are not yet organic and so that they can become also more sustainable by integrating practices and methods that are uh, coming from organic agriculture. And uh, we do so by providing capacity and leadership development, by accurate communication and campaigning to multipliers, like for instance, our Honest Food campaign. And also very important is that we advocate and we provide competence for a favorable policy environment for organic agriculture. Such policy environment should actually include the true societal costs of what we call public bats, which are the externalities of chemical industrial agriculture. And so at this occasion, we're very happy to work with the Global Landscapes Forum. The current theme on food and livelihoods directly relates uh, with our work to promote organic agriculture. We know from experience and studies that practicing agroecological and organic agriculture positively contributes to the livelihood of farmers and the majority of them being smallholders. And perhaps it's not a strange thought to also think about the livelihood of landscapes, or maybe even I should say foodscapes. Because as long as we know, people have related to their natural environment. They are part of it actually, and they need it for their survival. And many landscapes have functions as foodscapes for exactly this purpose. Um, but unfortunately, we are on a dangerous path right now 
by no longer respecting the interrelation between the livelihood of both humans and landscapes. So the Global Landscape Forum therefore rightly puts the focus on how to survive in the Anthropocene. And we from IFOM Organics International are convinced that such survival is possible only in relation and interrelation to our agroecological landscapes and by respecting planetary boundaries. Back to you, Conrad. Thanks, Louise. Thanks for the uh, introduction uh, to what we do, why we do it. And um, uh, we will hear from Louisa again later today. Uh, she will be part of our panel and she will also reintroduce us much later in the program. We have a lot of things happening. Uh, there's a lot of technicalities around here. This is a, yeah, it's a major event for us. And I'm, I'm really excited that we are using all these tools now interactively. So I would like to go and see what's happening on Slido, uh, see what you have done, what you have said so far. And we'll click through and, uh, and see what is on Slido. Please do that. And uh, if you're not on Slido and you're out somewhere else, tweet. There we go. We have uh, uh, Slido up. And we look at the, the words that are coming to mind, the word cloud. Sustainable being massive and central to it. Very good to see that. Sustainability. Health. Friendliness. Free. Um, wonder what is free is organic agriculture free and should it be free chemical soil sustainability great yeah so we're starting to get a feeling of of, of people's view on this uh we also asked you to um to have a look and tell us whether you buy organic and why and why not it usually takes a bit of time to to pop up um on a scale of one to ten there we go so on the scale of one to ten um one being never, 10 being always, it's all on the positive side. So we are preaching to a lot of people in the choir at the moment. That's great. Ah, there's some, uh, uh, it's starting to uh, move and change. So uh, eight being quite high, 31% of our respondents at the moment. Good. We are moving. You guys are there. I'm really good to see that. And uh, keep on posting. Slido will change every now and then. We'll bring you questions in. And now as we uh, go to our first panelists, um, we will also post questions over there. But before we get there, let's dive into some content. We'll get things going by looking at the principles of organic ag agriculture, namely health, ecology, fairness, and care. These four principles were posted and adopted by um, the organic movement well, a decade ago. And uh, we put together a video showing how organic farming can provide good food for all, be a solution to challenges such as biodiversity, uh, loss, and climate change. And throughout the video, we will ask you to tell us what you know about organic if you buy it and share more questions that you might have for the panel after the video. Please give your name and your location when you ask a question. At around about 13.45, we will start a live Q&A with our board members of Organic International, and uh, translation will be done in French and Spanish. Okay, so with that, I would like to move over to the video. Our vision is the worldwide adoption of ecologically, socially, and economically sound systems based on the principles of organic agriculture. Health, ecology, fairness, and care. This means growing food in a way that sustains the health of people and the planet. That nourishes living ecological systems and cycles that builds relationships, ensuring fairness both among people and in their relations to other living beings, and also protects and cares for the health and well-being of current and future generations as well as the environment. Soil. A solution to climate change? 
Day after day, we are pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the air and heating up our planet. Industrial agriculture is making things worse. Luckily, we have a solution to help cool things down, and it's right under our feet. It's the soil. Soil is our secret weapon in the battle against climate change. It absorbs huge amounts of carbon from all around us. In fact, it already stores three times as much as the atmosphere and five times as much as forests. Managed in harmony with nature, it has the potential to store much more. By using methods which are essential elements of organic farming, such as cover cropping, composting and crop rotations, farmers can enhance soil carbon sequestration. Soils managed in such a way can retain significantly more carbon than industrial monocropping systems. There are a lot of ways to increase soil organic carbon levels. Longer grazing periods and pasture management, hedges at field boundaries, agroforestry and restoring land in poor conditions. Besides cutting down on greenhouse gas emissions, using management practices that increase the quantity of carbon stored in the soils, we can slow down or even stop global warming. What's more, by not using harmful synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, organic agriculture keeps you and our planet healthy. Healthy soils equals healthy food, healthy people, and a healthy planet. You are waiting for the rain now? Also. Yeah, we are waiting for the yes. rain. <laughs> That's why That's you perfect. see now it is uh, yeah. withering. Yes. Yes. You can't see good green. We're experiencing a lot of drought in Kenya. Last year the rains failed. We didn't get the long rains in August. The September short rains failed completely. So because of that, the, um, we don't have a lot of food in Kenya. But on our farm, I, I, I need to be honest to say that uh, we have been affected to an extent. But what we have, uh, we still have some produce to sell. And how this has been possible is because uh, we have good soils. When I started doing organic farming, my type of soil has changed. I can keep more water than my neighbors. Uh, the soil stores more water, so I have more season, or rather longer season than my neighbors. Yeah. Sweet potatoes actually do well, you know, in, you know, with little water. And I decided to just plant this and um, you'll be amazed that for this little space, if we're to harvest all of this, we'll get even sometimes more than 50 kilos, just in a very small area. Yeah, they're very drought resistant. And I hope with time, like our government or policy makers will be able to take us back to drought resistant crops because the climate changes. It's getting to us. Dear friends, today I would like to share with you my understanding on the principle of health of organic agriculture. When people talk about the health, they are usually regarding to the health of human beings. Yes, of course, the health of human beings is our aim. It's so important. But the health of human beings comes from the healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy environment, healthy ecosystem, healthy nature, and a healthy earth. Even only regard to the health of human beings, there are two parts. Consumers 
and farmers. They cannot be separated. They are in one family. This is a win-win system, because when the consumers they pay more for the organic products, for the organic food, yes, they are benefiting themselves for their health. But of course, they are also benefiting the nature, the animals, the plants, the soils. And exactly they are benefiting the farmers for their health. You see, the farmers, when they apply chemicals in their fields, the chemicals, the contamination they get is hundreds and thousands times more than what the consumers, they take from the residues of their food. So the farmers, they are producing products for the consumers, but actually they are benefiting themselves. There is something say, saying one family, two systems. That means some, some of the farmers, they only apply chemicals in the fields that are supplying products of food to the consumers. And they keep their own parts, small parts of field without chemicals. They think they are protecting their, themselves. But actually, when they are applying chemicals in the large portion of their fields, they are still contaminated. So, there is no single winning part. This is a win-win system. We have to work together to make a sustainable, healthy earth to protect it, finally to protect the health of the human beings. Thank you very much. Let me tell you a story, a story about birds. In fact, let's look at one bird, the barn swallow. You may know it. It's the one that builds its nest under the roofs of village houses, farmhouses and barns. Bird populations, such as swallows, give us a good indication of how well our environment is doing. And how is it doing? Well, the fact is, it's not doing so great. Bird life is in decline. Industrial agriculture is changing our landscape and killing insect life, an essential food source for birds. And this helps explain the 30% reduction in the swallow population over the last decade. As we speak, Spain is losing about 500,000 swallows each year. But we can change this by choosing to buy more organically grown food and supporting farmers who farm in a biodiversity-friendly and sustainable way. Agroecological practices such as organic offer a wide range of pest control solutions. It's not just pulling the pesticide trigger. This is why organic farms are teeming with wildlife and offer birds both nourishment and a place to nest. In return, birds can help farmers control pests naturally. Love nature? Choose local, seasonal and organic. E con la cooperativa agricola Coraggio abbiamo da subito fatto la scelta di, di coltivare con metodo biologico. E si utilizza questo metodo innanzitutto per un atteggiamento di, di prudenza nei confronti di un sistema di cose molto complesso dove quindi l'uomo deve entrare in punta di piedi. Utilizzare un sistema biologico significa valorizzare al meglio le risorse che si trovano già in campo, innanzitutto. Non apportare fonti di energia da, dall'esterno, non intervenire in modo aggressivo eh, per il controllo degli amparassiti eh, piuttosto che delle erbe spontanee, ma cercare di far convivere tutti i sistemi, eh, diciamo tutti gli elementi eh, di un sistema complesso come quello agricolo insieme, cercando di far sì che si valorizzino a vicenda. Per questo non utilizziamo concimi di sintesi, 
non utilizziamo veleni che altrimenti poi finirebbe che mangeremmo come pesticidi e quant'altro e, e cerchiamo di eh, semmai trattare bene il suolo facendo sì che il suolo da solo trovi un equilibrio e riesca a essere nutriente, accogliente per le piante che poi l'uomo consuma. E per questo lavoriamo con i metodi come le rotazioni agricole delle colture, eh, spostando leguminose, ortaggi e cereali eh, in modo tale da garantire anche al terreno il giusto riposo e, e cerchiamo quindi fondamentalmente di agire il meno possibile con metodi il meno possibile invadenti con, per avere una produzione peraltro di maggiore qualità rispettando i ritmi del, delle, delle, delle stagioni e le produzioni stagionali e quindi anche facendo lo sforzo di interagire e conoscere meglio il clima. My topic today is biodiversity and ecosystem services, one of the four key principles of organic agriculture, actually. The relevance and extreme importance of biodiversity, both below and above ground, does hardly to have to be re-emphasized, I think, in this group of people. But not only for its intrinsic value as source of resilience and potential for adoption to changes, uh, uh, sorry, adaptation uh, uh, to changes such as climate change, but also as the backbone uh, for ecosystem services, which depend on the very availability of this biodiversity. Uh, healthy soils uh, are alive with all forms of life on Earth, as we know from bacteria, fungi, viruses, uh, nematodes, and up to small mammals, all key to assure that the soil ecosystem can handle the increasing physical and also biological stresses, which uh, we all know are coming up, um, and also provide ecosystem services, uh, such as nutrient cycling, water holding, carbon sequestration, uh, this among others. Uh, the biodiversity above ground provides resilience by increasing the capacity uh, for pest disease resistance and tolerance, both in its uh, varietal as well as genetic, genetic form, um, and uh, the supply of biological control, which I think is very important. So nature does not agree with reductionism. It needs the complexity made available by plant and animal diversity. Given the biodiversity is available, that means specially promoted through regenerative uh, agronomic practices, it will provide um, and support um, a healthy environment. And I think that's why we keep saying healthy people, healthy food, healthy environment, healthy animals. So it's all, all connected as we, as we know. And I think above all, all nutrient rich food and healthy people. We know if we grow our food in healthy soils, we'll have more uh, nutritious food, which is a very big element, I think, of what we try to do in organic agriculture. All this is cost-free and renewable, as much needed, um, and a bonus, actually, uh, is to sequester extra carbon. And we need to reduce our 450 ppm out there right now down to 380 and maybe even to 350. So again, organic agriculture is the way to go because it helps. Not only because we're going to have more biodiversity, but because we can have with all this diversity, also underground, above ground, we can sequester a whole lot more carbon. And again, you know, uh, deal with something which impedes or will impede agriculture a lot more in the future. So the implementation of organic agriculture in the framework of agroecology addresses all three sustainable development dimensions um, and it will be supported by the introduction of true costing that accounts for both the positive and as well as the negative externalities. So when we do true cost of accounting, we need to be sure that we also you know, uh, add in the positive, not only just talk about the negative ones. And I think organic agriculture is bound to bring very great results uh, in, in that direction. So there exists ample evidence uh, that with, with the organic agriculture 3.0 practices, 
the world can produce uh, food in sufficient quantity and above all quality, because the quantity is actually less the problem as the quality and where to nourish a global population at its peak in 2050 of some maybe 9 billion and a half billion, 9.5 billion people, or maybe less. I think uh, the trends now show that we even will be less people. So I think we need to stop uh, worrying about all this uh, talk about we need more fertilizer, more pesticide to grow more food. Let's do it the other way around. Let's see where we need more food, what quality of food we need, and what diversity. And I think that's where, again, this whole idea of diversity comes in, diversity of not only of the system, but what is inside that system from farmers to crops, uh, um, which is all very, very important to assure a, a good future. So in order to address the SDGs broadly and efficiently and create synergies across goals while avoiding the negative feedbacks as much as possible, we need organic agriculture 3.0 and it has much to offer and it's uh, the way forward.ซื้อปลาบัวจันทร์เมืองแปกแข่งเสียงขวางประเทศลาวค่อยอาศัยอยู่บ้านยอนเมืองแปกแข่งเสียงขวางประเทศลาวค่อยได้อยู่กับครอบ
าซื้อพักของค่อยเมื่อได้มีโอกาสค่อยก็ได้มีการบริการให้พวกเขาเจ้ามีบางคนก็มาซื้อกับส่วนของค่อยโดยกรงพวกเขาสังเกตเห็นว่าค่อยปลูกอย่างเด่ในสวนและได้ซีบอกว่าเขาต้องการพักอย่างเด่ภาวะเทียบใส่ลายหับการเฮ็ดหูกมือก้นเพียงว่าปีหนึ่งได้ห้าหกล้านต่อปีย้อนเห่าลบจนถึงออกปัจจุบันค่อยมาเฮ็ดส่วนอินทรีย์แล้วถึงจะน้อยค่อยก็พอใจว่าย้อนค่อยได้มีลายหับทุกๆมือเปลี่ยนแปลงหลายเมื่อก่อนเฮาก็กินพออยู่ใดซื้อแต่ปัจจุบันนี้ถือว่าทุกอย่างทุกอย่างเขาพร้อมแล้วจะเม่นไก่จะเม่นปลาจะเม่นพืชพักเขาอยากสนิทใดเขาก็สามารถเลือกจุดพื้นที่ของเขามาเฮ็ดกินเองอยู่ในเฮือนพัวเขาAre the providers of food. It is the direct and indirect interconnections between these elements of the cosmos that provide us food, good food, safe food. So, if this has to happen and keep happening for all time to come, then it is natural, only natural, that there should be equity, respect, and justice for and among all living beings in this ecology. That, in my opinion, is the meaning of the principle of fairness in the organic worldview. The primary actor in this whole cosmic dance is the farmer, and by the farmer I mean the smallholder farmer, the peasants. We also know that agriculture is responsible for 80% of the deforestation worldwide. However, this is not caused by the farmer I am talking about. This is caused by the large industrial forms of agriculture that have no respect for life on Earth, no space for equity or justice for any living being who inhabit this beautiful world of ours. In this reality, the small farmers, on the other hand, who grow most of our real food and bear all the risks, are slowly and steadily being erased from the story of agriculture. They who believe that the soil is their mother are becoming redundant. In this paradigm of economics, where growth is not only indispensable but also infinite, traditional agriculture has always practiced equity and justice for all living beings, where trust in life is an integral part of the farmer's worldview. Yet, the peasant in India today and possibly the world over is the lowest-paid worker. When they remain organic or turn organic. They actually honor us. They honor the earth. They honor the cosmos. They honor the denizens of this world. It becomes imperative then that the rest of the non-producers of food respect these farmers by not taking away their right to a good life. That they are compensated for all the risks they take to provide clean and safe food, while trying to maintain the ecological balance of a world. Increasingly being affected by climate change, that the earth is respected and compensated for all that we take from her, that the animals are respected and compensated for their services to the ecosystems, 
The principle of fairness is all about building strong, cordial, cooperative, honest, and respectful relationships. It's all about human dignity, solidarity, and social justice for all. Wherever I go, be it in India or abroad, people are wanting good food. Yet not everybody wants to pay premium that organic demands. And this is where the ideal of common goods economy comes in. The consumer should understand that their local farmers also want to live a good life. The farmers must understand that they are producers and providers of food that local consumers depend on and so should produce good food. We all need to trust and respect each other and then the rest will follow. I ended up in a field in North Dakota um, that actually belonged to a fellow by the name of Gabe Brown. And this was early April 2014, and it was a field that he had planted the previous autumn to a multi-species cover crop that he actually fed to his cattle. That was a real moment for me. All of a sudden, it meant that I needed to keep my soil covered. So I came home and and changed my thought process and tried to adapt what I'd seen in Gabe's field to my own. When we get a heavy rainfall event, once upon a time I would see soil literally like chocolate brown water running from my field, whereas now that water's clean. So that was the first benefit. Um, the second benefit is a reduction in the, in the necessity for um, synthetic forms of fertilizer. So I've been able to significantly reduce the amount of, of nitrogen in particular and phosphorus that I've been applying to my fields. When you plant a multi-species cover crop, how do you harvest it? Well, guess what? They harvest it for me and they turn it into beef. So there is my production. Most of us know how good worms are at um, helping to improve soil function. Well, dung beetles are even better because they actually dig big burrows in your soil and they take that dung down inside the soil, but then you've got all this other good stuff like your water and your air infiltration that follows those dung beetles down into the soil. So it's, a, it's another way that I can address those key underlying issues that I started with. You change your intent from having a, a bare, dead fallow to a, a covered, living fallow. Now what we are growing here, we are growing bananas and we, we are producing them organically. One can see how these bananas look like, but in order to produce such nice looking banana bunches, it requires one to utilize organic manure. And for me, I just utilize the pottery manure. Pottery manure promotes the better soils, and also whenever there is, uh, you know, you, you see how the, the soil looks like. The soil is like dark color, which is a mixture of the sandy soil and, the, and organic manure. This plant has a capacity to stay here more than 10 years promoting or producing the, the bananas for, for home consumption and also for sale. In this country, this is a food security because if you plant a banana, it stands to give you more than 10 to 15 bunches. But every year it can produce three to four bunches of which in the Ugandan currency, this one can sell like 20 to 30,000 per bunch. That is an income. And the challenge for this country in the raw settings is for the people to be able to earn an income on a daily, on a weekly and a monthly basis. By growing bananas and the coffee, as you can see around here, it is possible 
for the farmer to earn an income on daily, on weekly and monthly basis. The principle of care. I find the principle of care is a backbone, is the one that really unites all principles. You can't think about ecology without care. You can't think about health without care. You can't think about health without care. Care is all around and is what makes the change is what brings change. When I care about you, when I care about my own health, I care about your health, the health of soils, the health of the planet, that brings the energy and effort that will push change. We are facing a very unique moment in time. We are facing a pandemic, something my generation at least, um, early 30s uh, for me is quite new, a pandemic that has no borders, no money borders, no physical borders, no anything. The only thing we have to face it is to care about each other, to try to protect each other. Uh, we are currently in lockdown in my country because we are protecting each other. It's not about me, it's about me not infecting others and that care that I stay at home because I want to protect others is a spirit that should bring us and that we should implement in our daily life and this is only one problem we face in a bigger in a much bigger problem we are really facing that is climate crisis what future we will leave to our next generation, to my generation, actually, I might not even see it. But the ones coming after me, they, they will suffer it. So it's the time now to care, to really care of the steps we take, of the decisions we make, and how we design the future we want to see, the reality we want to build, we have an opportunity with this pandemic to really get out of business as usual and really start a new paradigm, to really start a new reality. But it's up to us and it's about how much we care about that future, about those others, those worms, those birds, those animals, the, that earth, those tomatoes, your family, your community, all those that are around you. That's why I believe the principle of care is really a backbone of all principles. That's why we need to care. We need to care about our present, about our future, about all that is around us. Warm greetings from Fiji. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. The Pacific's a unique region, thousands of small islands in the world's largest ocean, uh, with many commonalities, but also rich diversity culturally, geographically, and historically. Our biggest concerns though are of course global in nature, climate change, 
loss of biodiversity and the impact of our food systems on our health. But principles-based organic agriculture can provide a solution to these challenges and help contribute to our sustainable development. But I stress the principles-based part of that statement. We could possibly convert all of global agricultural production to organic based on a set of rules that limits the use of dangerous chemicals and practices. But ultimately that doesn't change our food production systems in the way that we need if we're to contribute to those big global challenges. We could easily just have an agricultural industrial complex that replaces toxic inputs with organic ones. But all the other vitally important things about the way we produce our food and work with our ecosystems, protect our health and, and culture wouldn't necessarily be benefiting. As you've heard from previous presentations, the principles apply to agriculture in the broader sense. It's about the way people interact with landscapes. It's about the way we relate to each other and how we shape the legacy for future generations. The principles express the contribution that organic agriculture can make to the world and a vision to improve all agriculture. Agriculture doesn't only feed us, our history, our culture, our community values are all embedded in agriculture. I'd like to reflect a little bit on what some of those global challenges look like in the Pacific and sea level rise is the most obvious example. Some of our islands like Tuvalu are only a meter or two above sea level at their highest points and some predictions put them entirely underwater in the not too distant future. Here in Fiji, we have earmarked 60 villages that need to be relocated inland. And it's not just about the complexity of new infrastructure or the cost, it's about the dislocation of communities and entire cultures, the loss of sense of place and self and identity. And we've had this experience before in the Pacific. We've had entire island communities displaced when their islands became unlivable due to phosphate mining for fertilizer. The Banaman community of Kiribati is an example. They now currently all are relocated in Fiji. And I'm sure the farmers that used that phosphate had no idea that their farming practices would have that sort of impact across the other side of the globe. Other impacts of climate are, of course, drought. Uh, we're having extended dry spells. Uh, in the last five years, several countries have had to ship in uh, drinking water and desalination plants just to survive these unusually long droughts. Tropical cyclones are likely to become stronger and more frequent. Uh, and right now I'm actually keeping my fingers crossed that we get this recording done before the next really noisy downpour associated with a cyclone that, that devastated Vanuatu two days ago with winds of up to 235 kilometers an hour. Loss of biodiversity is also really significant. Commercialization of taro farming in Samoa, for example, moved farmers from a diverse traditional agroforestry system with many varieties of taro and other species to large monocrop plantations of taro just with one variety. A blight came in and wiped out the entire industry in three months, uh, took millions of dollars out of the economy and the staple food was gone, leading to major changes in dietary habits. Maybe if we'd maintained those diverse varieties, some of which had resistance to the blight and kept more diversity in our farms, we would have been able to lessen the impact of that pest infestation when it came through. That leads me to my last point, the impact of our food systems on health. Globalization has really changed how we eat in the Pacific. We now eat the big three, corn, wheat, and rice, which were never part of our diets. And of course, we eat a lot more processed food, high in sugar and high in salt. Why? Because they're cheap. They're mass produced and supported by subsidies and the true cost of production, like environmental impact, isn't considered. So they get to our shelves at a really low price point. We're not nations with a lot of cash in our pockets and price point is a really powerful driver for consumers. We now have the highest rates of non-communicable diseases like diabetes in the world and growing weights, rates of micronutrient deficiencies. In the Marshall Islands, one in three children under five has stunted growth. And here in Fiji, someone has an amputation every 11 hours due to complications from diabetes. And we only have a population of 900,000 people. The good news, it's not all bad. All of those challenges can be overcome through building a food system based on the principles of organic agriculture. This requires a mind, ch mind change, a mindset change, and a vision that can only happen when we truly recognize how interconnected and interdependent we all are. Agriculture-wise, we're connected through the globalization of the food system, but our cultures and our homes, food connects us to others. It nourishes us.
So we must build food systems that support that nourishment of our bodies, nourishment of our communities and nourishment of our planet. These are really important discussions and I'd like to thank you again for enabling me to be part of this and I wish you well for the rest of the conference. And we are back live after watching our video. I'm glad to see so many of you are logging on uh, and I want to welcome you all back here. Uh, some really great questions have been coming up on Slido uh, and we are looking through them. Some of our panelists already and uh, the, panels will be, uh, the panel will be ready to answer those questions very soon. Uh, again, uh, if you like tweeting, please tweet. Uh, participate keep going with us through this and uh, we will check back into the slider questions very soon uh, I would like to start the next uh, panel discussion um, this will be moderated by my colleague Gabor Figetsky he is the head of global policy at iFarm Organics International and he has been involved in environmental and agriculture for many many years he uh, Apart from being the head of global policy here, he's really been working very hard promoting agroecology as a viable solution that can deliver results on all the SDGs. And uh, I think he's a very, very good person to uh, manage the next panel that is coming up. The panel will be talking about organic agriculture, the role that it can play in security and livelihood security. And uh, you can share your questions, as we said, through Slido. We'll ask as many as we can, and if you are tweeting, use hashtag eat, eat honest. And remember on the site that translation is available in French and Spanish. Unfortunately, not for the videos, but for this session. So, with all of that said, I would like to hand over to Gabor, and he will introduce our panel. Gabor. Thank you very much, Conrad, for, for the kind introduction. It is actually a true honor to be the moderator of this distinguished panel today. Um, this is a Q&A session. And first of all, I would like to thank our five speakers on it uh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, four of our speakers serve on the world board of iPhone Organics International. And Louisa, our executive, executive director, is joining them. It is a truly global panel. Uh, we have our speakers dialing in from Argentina, India, Germany, the USA, and Fiji, all of them conveniently confined to their homes like most of us in this strange world we have today. Before starting with the Q&A, however, um, I would like to turn to our wonderful and highly active audience to ask you to send us your questions to our panelists while listening to them as they speak. Uh, you can type in your questions in the online Slido platform um, where you joined the event. Uh, when doing so, please always mention your name, your country or region you are writing us from and possibly your affiliation, so the company or organization you are working for or you're, you are studying in. Um, you better be quick, um, as after the first round of responses uh, we get from the panel, so in around, uh, let's say, 20 minutes, uh, we will already select the questions uh, with the highest number of upvotes uh, to be answered by them uh, in the second round. Um, and so with a few thousands of people registered for, for this forum, uh, we expect a lot of questions to come in. Therefore, we will try to merge some of them and we will have to be somewhat selective. So please don't get disappointed if your input is not addressed in the end. Um, all contact details will be shared later and we will be very happy to get back to you after the session. Um, and of course, you are very welcome to tweet anytime using the hashtags eat honest and think landscape. So let's jump, jump now to our main topic today, uh, which is the challenges we have for and with global agriculture and food systems, um, possible ways and scenarios to fix them, and what role can organic agriculture play in this. Our first speaker today is our vice president, Karen Mapusua. Karen has been working for close to 20 years on empowering farmers in the Pacific community, serving 22 Pacific Island states. She's a national of Samoa and Australia and is based in Fiji now. She has a background in NGO capacity building and management, and she always looked at organic agriculture as a path to social and economic development. 
she is the co-founder um, of uh, the organization called POETCOM, which stands for the Pacific Organic and Ethical Trade Community, and was extensively involved uh, in developing um, alternative forms of certification that empower farmers. Karen, um, how does uh, our global agriculture and uh, food systems look today? Uh, who produces the majority of our food and what are the challenges that they are facing? Thanks, Gabor. That's a, a really interesting question. I think agriculture is a bit of a world of extremes for us at the moment. We've got the corporatization of um, industrialized agriculture, really high levels of mechanization and intensive farming, um, which are often environmentally quite destructive. But there's an estimated 600 million farms worldwide, and 70% of those are under one hectare and they only equal 7% of all agricultural land. So we've got this mix of big and small. Um, often, but not always, those small farmers are using more environmentally friendly methods, agroecology, and often carrying on from traditional practices. Um, but it's those small farmers that actually provide 70 to 80% of the world's food, depending on different sets of statistics. And of course, they're feeding into their own local markets, um, but also into those long commodity supply chains that we all enjoy, like coffee and cocoa and bananas. Um, so it's at a couple of different levels. The challenges, I think, in the, the sort of story of smallholders, and it's, it's similar but different, I think, across the world. Uh, smallholders are very vulnerable to economic and environmental shocks. They generally have quite low incomes. They're subject to really volatile commodity prices. Um, the, the livelihoods they have are high in labor and operating costs, but often get very low investment and not a lot of profit. Across the global south, and I think probably across all smallholders, uh, we're really bearing the brunt of the climate change um, crises that we're experiencing. And agricultural production is being significantly impacted by these unpredictable weather patterns and the extremes that we're already seeing, intensified heat, natural disasters, droughts, this combined with low access to adapted technologies and aging farming population, the volatile markets and little or no social protection really puts the small producers at risk. I guess you could say now that the smallholders are facing a triple livelihood crisis. It's climate, it's price, and of course now health with the, with the COVID issue. And many governments are recognizing farmers as an essential service, but this, current state of the way agriculture is supported and the support provided to farmers doesn't really reflect the essential services that our smallholders provide because they really do feed the world. Thanks, Gabor. Thank you very much, Karen, for this uh, comprehensive uh, response and uh, answer. Um, and also thank you for uh, giving uh, very hands-on uh, examples from, from your own experience. Um, now I'm turning to um, our uh, World Board member uh, from India, uh, who is our next speaker, uh, who is a development activist himself, um, a social entrepreneur and a change maker working with marginalized and rural populations uh, in Andhra Pradesh, India. He is now the chief functionary and executive director of the Timbuktu Collective, uh, who, with 40 years of experience, uh, directs the collective's efforts to promote several producer-owned rural businesses, business enterprises. Um, Bablu has been a member of the World Board of Artform Organics International since uh, 2017. Bablu, um, at times of crisis like uh, this one with COVID-19, um, the economic implications of which we are probably just starting to feel, uh, standing together can mean more than anything. Will you be able to rely on your people's power to re revitalize economy on, in your locality? And also, uh, women often play a key role in such revitalization, revitalization processes. Uh, can you shed a light on how organic agriculture helps empower them to play this role? Well, we, we, we work uh, not just with smallholder farmers. We, work with landless laborers, artisans, people with disabilities, children, and, other, and most of all, women. Other than the farmers cooperative, the disabled people's cooperative, et cetera, we have promoted uh, women's cooperatives. 
and they have about 23,000 members and they manage an incredibly successful alternative banking program with about 3.3 million US dollars as their uh, uh, capital. So this has made them into a massive force in the area and they're able to make their voices heard. We've been working with them for over 27 years and they understand local economics very well. At this time of crisis, we have been in touch with almost all the 25,000 families that we work with. Everybody is waiting to restart their work. The farmers cooperative is uh, preparing to start pr procuring the crops. They have prepared uh, the processing center, are getting ready to go in for production. If all goes well, from May, we will start the crop planning process in the villages for the coming Karif agricultural season. The women's cooperatives will, of course, be key in this economic revitalization, as they are the ones that have the money that will be required to start up. Most of the other cooperatives, all of them, are in some way or the other into economic activities and have women leaders who are also members of the women's uh, co-ops. So I believe that um, we will be able to restart the whole uh, economic uh, revitalization that will be required once this whole pandemic thing kind of goes down. Thank you for your wisdom, Bablu, and for the insight into the amazing work that you're doing with and for your communities. Um, when it comes to uh, social groups, uh, we shouldn't talk only talk about the role of women. In many parts of the world, citizens get more and more uh, detached from agriculture and farmers. And the younger generation seem to be harder and harder to reach and get engaged in agriculture. Um, our next guest in the panel today is Julia Lernu, uh, who established a group called Young Organics, exactly with the purpose of connecting young organic actors and to enhance knowledge transfer between the generations. Uh, her story started at her family organic, her family's uh, organic farm and a family company, a Rincon Alcanico, an organic retailer, exporter, and restaurant. Uh, Julie organized several times the presence of organic food in massive music festivals, and where once people only had fast food choices, they had fresh, real food, full of flavor and color at reasonable prices, showing that organic food can, can be for everybody. Later, she became a scientist and worked for the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture on the collection of organic market, da market data worldwide and the production of an the annual report the world of organic agriculture, which is the main source of data on organic agriculture globally. Uh, Julia, how can we make sure that young people want to be part of the agriculture of the future? Hi, Gabor, thank you. And um, thank you, the, the others, the previous coming is very interesting in the discussion. And I think it's not only young people we need to get back into agriculture or back connected again with food itself, no? Uh, I think humanity as a whole has disconnected from food and that comes also disconnection from agriculture. When we started Yard Organic, one thing was how we can make agriculture a bit more sexy for the youth. Now, we have to understand that in many parts of the world, I come from Argentina, it's a very large country where distances are quite extensive. So maybe the nearby town to your farm is 100 kilometers. So how you connect with people, uh, it's hard to make a living sometimes from farming in many cases actually. So actually young generations are not very tempted to stay in farming. So we start to see a lot of migration from farms to the cities and actually, what we see now is that those, pe those young people coming from the farms to the cities and look for a better life, they are actually not reaching that better life. They are in the slums or in really the poor areas of the cities. And so with Young Organics and with the work we are doing at iPhone, trying to connect with the youth, trying to make this more sexy and more attractive, the farming for the youth, 
I think is a crucial part, but we need to work also on how we make, how we reconnect with food as a whole, no? Not that it only comes from a supermarket, from a vending machine, or it comes from a restaurant, but it comes from a grower. And bring pride to that grower, no? Really make farmers a key actor in the game. Uh, we have forgotten that now it's more important the factory of a phone or a computer than a farmer that I always remember a human being as any animal needs good air, good water, good food to survive. We don't need clothes, we don't need, it's, of course it's much better, it's much better to have shelter, but we need good food. We really need good food to survive. So. I think we need to bring back that discussion and take away the shame of the farmers. Of, and for that, we need to ensure empowerment to farmers. We need to ensure good livelihoods, good incomes, true costs for them, uh, that they have the tools and the access. And for especially for young people, what we have been working a lot is to create platforms where they can meet. You, as what I just said, the large distances sometimes they face. Um, is a full-time job to be a farmer, so there's not much time to socialize, so really create places where young people can interact. We have great examples at iFarm with the Youth Forum, where people from all across Asia gather together and exchange their experiences, so they feel they are part of a bigger community, that they are not alone in this journey. I think that's a crucial part. But it should go in hand with work with consumers, work as a society. I think now with the pandemic, we are recognizing the value of health workers, of the police, of the people working that make the daily life easier. But we forget sometimes that we also should clap. We are clapping every night here in Argentina at night, 9 p.m. to the doctors, but we should also clap to the farmers. And remember that without them, we wouldn't have food, no? So I think it's a, it's a bigger change we need to have. I think we are on that way because more consciousness is around, also because climate change is forcing us, discussion is forcing us. But um, yeah, I think help them connect, especially for the young people, help them give them platforms to connect, to stay, not feel alone, bring proudness for farmers, reconnect with food, with farming, consumers, etc. I think those are the main points. Maybe it was a bit too much. Thanks a lot, Julia, um, for outlining what, what we actually need to do to uh, reconnect farm to farmers and also to, to give them uh, the, the recognition that they actually deserve. So, a clap to the farmers is actually a great idea. Um, our next speaker was also raised uh, on a family farm, but this family farm was in the Netherlands. And uh, then she went on studying biology and philosophy at the Utrecht uh, University. Uh, she is uh, Louisa Lutikholt, our executive director uh, since 2018. And she has extensive experience in organic agriculture, fair trade, and international development cooperation. Her career has included work for Fair Trade International and the Swiss development organization Helvetas. Luisa, you were the main driving force behind the articulation and the def definition of the four principles of organic agriculture. Uh, how can these principles uh, guide us in fixing uh, our broken food systems? Well, thank you, Gabor, for your question and pointing back to the uh, principles. And I think part of the answer to your question is already in the way you uh, pose it. Because we have to look at food again in terms of food system. And a food system is more than only a farmer providing to supermarket. We have to think about everything that is around it and that influences this food system. So what's the education that we provide? to the farmer, but also what's the education that we provide to the consumer? How are we relating to input companies and what kind of power do they have in the market? How uh, independent are farmers in making their own choices or how much are they driven by, um, 
by things like shame that Julia just said, or maybe by uh, influence on, on uh, projection on short time uh, gain. And how much do they have the opportunity to actually take care for their environment or are they in a bare survival mode? And then also we need to look at how um, the supply chain works and how supermarkets uh, set a price. Uh, and there the question comes whether this price really represents the full cost of what a, a, a healthy and nutritious product costs. So if we look at the principles of organic agriculture, basically they point to all kinds of externalities that there are and that organic agriculture tries to include. And if we then include that again and look at that as a whole in the food system, then we can maybe come to solving some of the challenges that we have. Or the other way around, I think that we have some of the challenges now because we take food as just any other product that there is in the market. Whereas basically it's the basic of our living, it's our livelihood, and it's also the basic of our environment. Thank you very much, Louisa, um, for outlining um, all the benefits and also um, of a, a more sustainable way of farming and also reminding us of the ex externalities our society has to be there uh, due to uh, conventional agriculture. Um, now we've come to the end of the first round of questions, and I think it is time for us to, to hear uh, what the audience is interested in. Um, I can tell you we are in a difficult situation trying to rapidly select and merge your questions coming in from all parts of the world. Um, but maybe uh, we can start with the one uh, that has come in from Pim van der, van der Horst in the Netherlands. Um, how can we reduce the gap between conventional and organic agriculture without giving in on the fields of productivity and sustainability? Um, Karen, would you be interested in answering this one? Yes, I can give that a go, Gabor. Thanks for the question. And it's I guess it's the million dollar question because we often hear about the yield gap between conventional product and organic product. But I think we need to sort of maybe broaden the discussion a little bit um, so that we're not only looking at productivity. That Yes, that is very, very important, but there are a whole lot of other things that help balance up that yield gap question. And one of those things is that we know that organic systems often actually perform better in marginal lands or in poor growing conditions. And as we are moving into a changing climate and all those different scenarios, it might well be that over time, our organic systems are naturally building that yield gap because the conventional systems aren't so resilient and won't do so well in that changing environment. The other thing I think we need to consider is where food waste fits into this picture. Yes, there is a yield gap, but we are also wasting a huge amount of food. And a lot of the recent climate change discussions have pointed in that direction as something we really need to address in the whole climate and sustainability discussion. But I guess the other really important thing is research. Um, most resources for agricultural research go into the conventional field. If we can redirect even a small portion of that towards um, studying organic systems and looking for the solutions that farmers need, that's another way we can bridge that gap. Uh, and it's been an area that really is neglected uh, in our budgets for research in agriculture. We can switch that. We'll definitely be able to go away towards addressing that yield gap. I hope that starts to answer a very complex question. Thank you very much, Karen, for the comprehensive response to this question. Our next one would be then a question from uh, Oisin. I, I believe this is an Irish name. Uh, could you touch on the main differences between agroecological and organic practices and farming? As I understand, an agroecological can be organic and vice versa. So is there a defining important difference? Um, Julia, would you take this one? Thank you, Gabor. Yeah, we'll try. Um, well, basically in the organic movement, I form organic, we have defined what organic is. Agroecology, uh, agroecology is quite of a big term that involves many things. We find organic is inside the agroecology family. But we can see that agroecology means something in Latin America, in the Pacific, in Africa, in Europe. It 
it changes a bit. We have the 10 basic principles from FAO to define what agroecology is, and we see organic as part of it. Organic, however, is quite defined in many countries. We have actual public standards that define what organic is and what is not. We have control systems to verified, we have such a species or third party certification, etc. But in principle, I think we are all going towards a better agricultural system, a more inclusive, more fair. So I always see it as part of the big family, no? Where, um, yes, here in the question it says organic and agriculture are the same, vice versa. In many ways they are, in some ways they're differentiate each other, organic has a specific methods, has specific priorities, and, but I think we are very in line and we are in this work together. That's why with the new uh, strategy and with Organic 3.0, as we call it, we are trying to work all together towards this new agricultural system, this new paradigm where we see farming in more harmony with nature, in harmony with societies, in harmony with farmers, in, that's the bigger picture. So I would say in brief words that yes, we have the big globe of agroecology, organic is part of it, is inside it. It might be a bit more defined, but we feel part of a bigger family. I hope that helped. Yes, definitely. Thanks a lot, Julia. Um, now we have a next one which has come in from Ibrahim from Morocco. Um, and I think, uh, Luisa, you already touched a little bit upon this question, so I would give this one to you. Why does organic food have to be more expensive than just normal food? Gabor, I'm here, but I try to start my video and um, it currently says I can't, but if you allow me, I would just uh, try to speak without video. Oh, here I am. So um, when we look at um, yeah, the costs of food and the price of food, I think we have to differentiate two different things. So most probably uh, the, the person who poses the question is looking at what uh, she pays or he pays at the counter. Um, but we are not sure whether the price that you pay at the counter actually reflects the true costs. So we have to look a little bit deeper and um, when we currently look to chemical agriculture, we pay the costs somewhere else. And um, the first time when we pay costs, when there are costs for chemical agriculture, is when our tax money is going to go into subsidies for farmers to buy, for instance, chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides. Then the second time is when we really go to a market or a supermarket and pay for the produce. But then there are a third time when there are also costs from chemical industrial agriculture. And that is when we suffer with our health from, for instance, water that's not clean. And a fourth time uh, is also when we need to uh, pay for cleaning up and have environmental costs. So we have to look a little bit deeper and see whether the price that we currently pay for agricultural products really reflect the costs. And, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, most of the products that are produced with uh, chemicals do not reflect the true costs. Now, if we look at organic agriculture, the cost I just talked about, health, clean water, um, no subsidies, they're already included in what we pay when we buy the product at the market. And so then we say they are internalized. And so basically, uh, it's not a, a fair game that we're playing there. So that's why we are playing for something that we call true cost accounting. And we look at all the costs and externalities that the production uh, has. And then again, it would be interesting to really compare uh, the price of both organic agriculture products and products that are produced by chemical agriculture. And we definitely may see a differentiation there, a difference there as well. And now it would be even interesting if we were to go one step further, if we really would impose those costs in the final product price, because that might well be a uh, stimulus and an um, 
incentive for farmers to try to move to more sustainable practices. And that's exactly what we would like to see happen. So I hope that this um, clarified a little bit. Um, but I think it's, yeah, the main point is to make a differentiation between price and the costs that are behind them. Yeah, I think it definitely did. Um, I think a, a level playing field is, is what we need for, for all sorts of uh, agriculture products. Um, our next question um, seems to be coming from someone who, who is more involved uh, with organic agriculture. Uh, his name is Stephen Jacobs uh, from the Organic Farmers and Growers uh, Organic Control Board, Body, I guess. Um, and he's asking, organic is a whole system approach. How do we enable a transition to a whole system approach from those not yet engaging with organic food systems? Um, Babalu, you are someone who is engaging a lot of uh, people from your community. Would you be able to address this question? Can you just repeat the question once more? Um, so uh, organic is a whole system approach. How do we enable a transition to a whole system approach from those not yet engaging with organic food systems? Well, I mean, if one really wants to do organic farming, one has to go in the whole hog. And uh, I mean, I'm saying this from my personal experience that un unless we look at our land and our soil and where we come from or where we are doing farming, unless and until we look at that as one agroecological system, and relate to each one of them, it's like, like doing a permaculture design. And if you don't design it in such a way that you, you look at all the aspects of organic farming, then it doesn't really work. And that includes participation in the value chain. Uh, you know, in, in, in the whole process of adding value to the product, in the whole process of reaching out to the consumers. Um, so, yeah, basically, if you want to do organic, then you have to go the whole hog. Is what I'm what I mean to say. I don't know if this answers the question, but um, um, I really hope so. Um, I I understood it the same way as you did, probably. Um, Karen, uh, the next question uh, would uh, go to you. Uh, will the organic sector? Uh, the question is from Federica. Uh, from Italy, uh, will the organic sector come out from this pandemic crisis strengthened? How can we uh, leverage that uh, the current situation to advocate for more support for organic and agroecology? Mm. Yeah, the the current disruption I think has um, enormous potential for the organic sector. Um, what we are seeing is so many shifts in supply chain and a real recognition that we need to be able to sometimes get our food just a little bit closer to home. Um, and also that we need to be able to grow food that is not always entirely dependent on a whole lot of external inputs as well. So I think there's a, some mind shifts around that that will happen out of this pandemic and this crisis that is currently happening. Um, I think we need to be able to demonstrate also to the world what we can provide as an organic sector. Uh, that there are ways of growing that aren't dependent on shipping your fertilizer from across the, the world or your pesticides or something else. Um, so we do need to be able to demonstrate that, I think, very effectively. And that's where the advocacy comes in. We, we need to walk the talk. If I'm a farmer, I like to see it working in someone else's field. I won't necessarily listen to what someone is telling me is going to work. It has to be demonstrated. So if we can make the, you know, use this crisis to demonstrate that. Um, I think that will be a really valuable thing. Um, just going back to, can we come out of this strengthened? I think we can not only come out of it strengthened, but we can come out of it leading. This is an opportunity to really examine the food system and look at all the things that could be corrected. I don't think that with COVID we're learning 
anything new. We know that these problems existed in the food system. Um, we know that there's distribution issues. We know that there's injustice issues. There's, we know that there's environmental damage. But often it's only seen when there's a disaster somewhere or when there's a particular issue in one country. Now we're all affected. Uh, there's no way out for anybody except to, to come together in this. So I think from that point of view alone, the fact that this is really highlighting those problems that have existed for such a long time, it gives us a good platform to really reflect and say, okay, let's do something different. And that should really be our starting point. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karen. Um, our next question is coming from Wong, Malaysia. And uh, the question is, why does organic has to be related to soil? I think this is a great question. Can the vegetables from soil-less production, such as hydroponic farming, aquaponic, and uh, aeroponic, consider organic? Um, Louisa, would you go for this one? And I would like to ask you to limit your contribution to two minutes now, because we have to wrap up soon. Well, two minutes is quite short for such a profound question. Um, in organic agriculture, we uh, put a lot of emphasis on soil and soil health, as that is uh, the basis, not only for food production, but also for uh, a broader relation with the nature and uh, the environment. And so if we take, care, uh, take good care for soil, we also take good care for um, ourselves and, and for the future. Um, there have been, of course, systems and there are even uh, water salads that, that grow on water from their natural perspective um, themselves. But we do think that the interaction with a healthy soil, with a plant, is of importance in organic agriculture. There's another aspect to um, soilless production as well. And that uh, has to do with a totally different motivation that is behind it. Um, which looked like, and if we can uh, produce, let's say, in factory kind ways, um, which moves us actually away from a clear interaction with uh, the nature on which we depend around us. And even if we were to do to work in hydroponics, still the seeds come from somewhere in nature, um, and even um, some of the feeding stuffs that we need to have. So why fake that environment if you can also do it live and have the benefit of all the nutrients that the roots can take up from the soil? Um, I know there are attempts in uh, using hydroponics uh, in, for instance, city cases and others, but we still believe that uh, for organic agriculture, soil is the basis. And so that's why we have drawn a clear line there that hydroponics are not part of organic, but actually uh, that plants should be in interaction with the healthy soil to provide a healthy food for all of us. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, with this conscious of the time, we will have to wrap up, wrap up I'm afraid, and I'm just realizing as, as we are doing such a Q&A, how little ground we can actually cover uh, within 40 minutes. So I have to apologize to all of you who didn't get your questions answered. Our time was, was very limited. Um, so get, to get you, all your answers, please join us on Facebook and read our blog, Organic Without Boundaries. Uh, we might have covered some of your topics there, but you're also very welcome to suggest topics to, to uh, this blog. Anyhow, to me personally, it was an extremely insightful discussion covering uh, so, many, so many aspects of global agriculture and the contribution of agroecology as well as organic, uh, from science and innovations to livelihoods and community building, from empowering women and youth to tackling climate change and biodiversity loss. So a big thank you to all the panelists for their eloquent contributions. Um, with organic offering so much to a circular economy, I'm even more excited to listen to the debate on a possible brave new world without farmers, where all the food will come from labs. But first we will hear from farmers themselves. So stay safe, stay home, and stay tuned. It's back to Conrad now.